they turned out to be right. Liz was there and danced with the man. The word danced was relative. Her arms were wrapped around his neck and his hands were on her ass. He said something to her and her head fell back. Her long hair hung down. It was obvious that she was drunk. I walked up to them, removed her hands from his neck and began to pull her away. Hey dude, what the hell are you doing? asked her dance partner. She's my wife and I'm taking her home, I replied. Any resistance he might have put up disappeared immediately. She's yours, he said. She's never good in bed when she's drunk. When are you sober? I asked him, picking her up to take her out. Oh, then she's great. Ask anyone. We all think she's one of the best. Someone opened the door for me, and I carried her out to my pickup and threw her in the passenger seat. Just a few minutes later, I brought her to my parents, where they watched as I unceremoniously laid her down on the bed. She was unconscious. Hell, she was probably unconscious on the dance floor when her ass was groped. I didn't say a word as I left. Ruth was my older sister. She was one of my two sisters. The other is Esther, Esther Jacobs. I also have two brothers, Matthew and Luke Reynolds. My name is Mark Reynolds. Our parents were lifelong Southern Baptists, so all five children were baptized at Sitico Creek in Vonor, Tennessee, and attended church every Wednesday night and all Sunday morning as children. We never had a television, but we did have a radio that we were only allowed to turn on to listen to gospel music on Sundays. Of course, when we were not near our parents or when they were far from us, all the hidden devices appeared and we became ordinary children. We were all sure we kept them well hidden from mom and dad, but I'm sure they knew about them. Our parents learned to read so they could read the Bible, and that was the only thing they ever read. We grew up in extreme poverty. All five of us knew from an early age that we didn't want the same life as our parents. As soon as we graduated from high school, we couldn't wait to leave Vonor. Ruth and Matthew went to Nashville. Esther and Luke only made it as far as Madisonville. None of them went to college. Ruth always had a talent for cooking and began working as a cook's assistant in a diner. Matthew went to a truck driving school where he was lucky and found himself under the wing of one of the instructors. When he finished, this instructor got him a job as a driver for one of Nashville's megastars. Such jobs are worth their weight in gold and usually only go to experienced drivers with good connections, but his instructor had his own people. Matthew turned out to be an above-average truck driver and had the charisma to match. I was a little different. After high school, I attended Vanderbilt University on a four-year Army Rotic Scholarship. Upon graduation, I was appointed second lieutenant. My first assignment after the junior officer course was to the headquarters of the 8th Army in Korea. I stayed there for 13 months before returning home for a 30-day leave and starting my next assignment at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I spent a few days with my parents before heading to Nashville to visit Ruth. Our brother Matthew was on tour somewhere. He drove one of several trucks carrying equipment for the Stars show. Lighting, setup, everything needed for a big show in Nashville was in these trucks. Ruth had a small apartment and I slept on her couch. She was dating a man she met in a cooking class at a local community college. His name was Gerald Thompson. Gerald had a sister named Elizabeth, but everyone called her Liz. The four of us went out for dinner one day. Then Liz and I went alone. Then we went again. By the time my vacation ended, Liz and I were already in a relationship. Fort Campbell was only an hour from Nashville, so I spent a lot of time there, and Liz came to Campbell often. She loved sex. We had sex on our fourth date and didn't stop. Eighteen months after we met, we got married. Liz was a Nashville native who had never lived anywhere else. Her father was a urologist and her mother was a housewife. Liz and I completed our three-year tour in Campbell before we were sent to Germany. Germany was a huge culture shock for both of us. Liz became involved in the Rookie Club and the Officer's Wives Club. She learned to play bridge and played with the other wives every week. We also joined the Travel Club. Once a month, we went to different places, Italy, Switzerland, Spain, and so on. Over the last few months of our three-year tour, Liz began to really enjoy European wine. 
I grew up in a non-drinking family and never developed a taste for alcohol. Our next assignment was back to Fort Campbell, which we were both very pleased with. We moved into service housing and were happy for about six months. Then Liz began spending a lot of time in Nashville. We went there for the weekend and she wanted to stay a day or two longer. It became three days longer. A year later, she was actually living with her parents. I went there on weekends. The only sign of trouble was that I arrived at Liz's parents one Friday and she wasn't there. They had no idea where she was. I arrived early, just after lunch. Her mother made excuses that she didn't expect me so early. I was about to take my bag into Liz's room, but her mother tried to stop me. Let me clean up first, she said. It's okay, I replied. The room was in disarray. Dirty clothes were everywhere. I found it strange that the bed was covered in dirty clothes, but it was obvious that it had been made and had not been slept on. With the amount of dirty clothes on the bed, it was clear that it had not been slept on for several nights. Her mother tried to collect some of the dirty clothes, and I saw her stuffing her panties under the bed. I asked her to leave, saying that I needed to go to the bathroom. When she left, I took out my panties from under the bed. There were two more pairs there, and I took them too. I took them into the living room. Her mother was on the phone, but when she saw me, she immediately hung up. I held my panties up. How long has she been sleeping with other men? I asked. I think this is a matter you should discuss with her, her mother replied. I went back to the bedroom, packed my bag, put my panties in my side pocket, and headed out. Will you come back? asked her mother. I didn't answer and went straight to Ruth's house. She and Liz's brother stopped dating a couple of years ago, but remained friends. Ruth has since met and married the owner of a music business TH store named Eric Wyndham. Liz and I returned to the States for their wedding. On the way to Ruth's I called her, and she told me where she had the key hidden. She was busy so we couldn't talk. She only managed to say that she would not return home until midnight because she had to close the restaurant. At her house, I tried to call Liz, but there was no answer, so I left a message. That's your husband. You know, the only person you should sleep with. I want to hear your explanation for why that's not the case anymore. I also want to know how many there were and why. Eric got home around seven and I told him everything. Ruth called a little after eight. She told me that she had just received a call from her ex-boyfriend, Liz's brother. He, in turn, has just heard from his friend that Liz is drunk and flirting with a couple of men at the Count Monte Music Bar. He was going to go there and take her home. Ruth told him not to worry. I was here and I will take care of it. When I laid her down on the bed, both her parents were there. Her mother started scolding me, saying that everything Liz did was my fault because I took her to Germany where she learned to drink and do all sorts of vile and evil things. I looked at them both, walked out and headed back to Ruth's house. Eric and I talked until Ruth arrived and then the three of us talked until three in the morning. I slept on their couch again. I woke up at seven, made myself a cup of coffee, and sat on their front porch, getting ready to talk to Liz. Ruth and Eric joined me at nine. We talked for about another hour. They were wondering what I was going to do, and I told them I had no idea. It was already after ten in the morning when I rang the doorbell of Liz's parents. Liz's father opened the door and let me through. Liz was sitting on the couch with a cup of coffee. I walked up to her and threw the dirty panties into her cup. She picked them up, threw them on the floor, and, raising the cup to her lips, took a sip. Why? I asked Liz. You don't have to answer, dear, her mother intervened. Don't interfere, I said coldly. Why? I repeated Liz's question. She raised her head and looked at me. I needed to be loved, and you weren't there. How many times have you needed love and I wasn't there? What? How many times have you slept with other men? I don't know. Approximately? A couple of dozen. How many different men? I don't know. Approximately. Six. Maybe seven. Maybe ten. I'm not sure. Does our marriage mean anything to you? She raised her head and, looking straight at me, took another sip of her coffee without answering. I left and returned to Ruth. It didn't take long to tell them what happened. 
And she had no remorse? She didn't apologize? Asked Ruth. No. Lord, this is an ice woman, she said. Exactly, I replied. There was no point in staying in Nashville, so I headed back to Fort Campbell. I was surprised when Liz came to our house on Sunday afternoon. I was lying on the sofa, and she sat on the armrest where my legs were. She sat there for a couple of minutes. Sorry, she said. Don't say another word. If the only reason you're cheating is because I wasn't there when you needed sex, that's pretty pathetic because you intentionally stayed away from the house, so I wouldn't be around to take care of you and your needs. You preferred to get drunk and sleep with strangers instead of going home and sleeping with your husband. This is a rather weak excuse for the dissolution of a marriage, and your parents are just as guilty as you for allowing you to do this. The only thing you can do now is pack up and leave. I do not want to leave. I said I was sorry. This will not happen again. I don't care how many times this happens. As far as I know, we're not married anymore so you can do whatever you want with whoever you want. All I care about is that you leave. I took the remote control and turned on the TV. She snatched it from my hands and pressed the mute button. I will not leave. You are my husband and this is my home. She threw the remote control back to me and left the room. She cooked dinner, but I made myself a sandwich and ate it in the living room. She ate what she had prepared and stayed in the kitchen. Before going to bed, I took a shower and went to bed. She also took a shower and lay down, clinging to me as close as possible. I rolled over. Do you seriously think I would ever have sex with you after six, seven, or ten other men have used your body? I said I was sorry. And you think this will fix everything? Yes. You seriously need help. I can't stop you from sleeping in this bed but I don't have to stay here and think about all those men who had sex with you. I went into the living room and fell asleep on the sofa. When I woke up, she was sitting in a chair and looking at me. I ignored her, showered, shaved, put on my uniform, and went to work. After the report, I spoke with my commander and told him about my situation. If I were you, the first thing I would do would be to see a lawyer. Take as much time as you need. I spoke with several attorneys that day and decided on Kirby Dickinson. He was a retired army lawyer and knew what military personnel faced. What do you want from me and why? He asked. I want your advice because I don't know what to do, I answered. Do you want to try to save the marriage? No. Why? Because she cheated and I will not tolerate my husband's betrayal. How do you know that she cheated? I told him. It means nothing in court, Lieutenant. By that time, I was already a first lieutenant. She can tell you and a hundred other people that she slept with both the Army and Navy football teams 50 yards away in front of a full stadium and then deny it to a judge, and the judge will believe her if you don't have proof. He shook his head. These are just facts. He paused. So if you don't want to save the marriage, that must mean you want a divorce. Am I right? Yes, sir. I think you are right and I don't think you want it easy for her. Am I right? Yes, sir. You are right again. Fine. I like it when people agree with me. This reinforces what I already know. And what is it? That I'm a smart son of a bitch. We both laughed. Now here's what I think you should do. If she lives with you, give her silence. Ignore her, even when she screams, swears, and throws things at you. Most likely she will go to her mother or her boyfriend or somewhere far away from you. When this happens, she will most likely return to her old adulterous habits and find someone to sleep with. When that happens, we'll just have to make sure someone is there to film it. When we go to trial, even if the judge decides we can't use the video, he will know that you are telling the truth and that your wife really cheated on you. I can almost guarantee that the judge will rule in your favor. That's how it works here in Kentucky. Now, the downside to this plan is that someone will have to be available 24 7 to record her antics, and it won't be cheap. But I guarantee it will save you money in the long run. Do you agree? Absolutely. Fine. Write me a check for my fee, and then write another one to the detective I find for you. I felt better but poorer when I returned to my office. Liz called me at six in the evening, and per Kirby Dickinson's instructions, 
I did not answer. It was already past ten when I entered the house. She was waiting for me. How long will it be going on? She asked. I apologized. Now we can return to normal life. I ignored her and went to shower. Twenty minutes later I was in bed and heard her drive away. I stood up, looked into our shared closet and saw that most of her clothes were gone. I returned to bed and fell asleep. The next morning I called Kirby Dickinson and told him she had left, probably to Nashville. Great. I know some people there. Do you know where she could have gone? I gave him the address of her parents. Fine. The game has begun, he said. Less than a week passed, and I had a video of her having sex with two men. Forty-eight hours after I received the video, she was served with papers demanding a divorce due to adultery. Less than an hour after receiving the documents, she called, crying and begging me to forgive her. I hung up. I kept my boss informed. He experienced the same thing many years ago. The big difference was that his wife cheated on him when he was in a war zone. This, without a doubt, is the worst thing a spouse can do, to cheat when a soldier is in danger. My next step was to inform the post housing that I was vacating the apartment. The next day I moved to the barracks for single officers. Three days later, Liz called and said she couldn't get into the house. I told her this is not our home anymore. I moved because she left me and I was not entitled to housing on post as a lone officer. But you're not alone. You're married, she said. I laughed and pressed the end button. I think she's back in Nashville. As I already mentioned, I don't drink alcohol. It started with my Southern Baptist upbringing, but even as an adult, I never developed a taste for alcohol. The same thing happened with obscene language. I've never been used to curses. Other people drinking and using coarse language didn't bother me. It's just not for me. Likewise, I am not a Puritan. Intimate dancing is hot when you dance with your wife or girlfriend. Looking at naked or semi-naked women is also hot. I love a woman's body, and if she wants to show it off, I'll be happy to watch it. That night, though, I used every four-letter word I'd ever heard, and probably some I came up with while watching a video of my wife having sex with two men. I inserted the video into my computer. Watching my wife take off her clothes in front of two men was surreal, but nothing compared to what happened next. At first I thought she might be drunk, but the way she spoke, she wasn't. Come on, guys, she said. Show me what you have for me. I've never done this with two at the same time. This should be fun. It will, bitch, said the tall man. Don't call me a bitch. I hate this word. They lay side by side for several minutes before the short one spoke. It wasn't bad. Want more? God, yes. I pressed the pause button. I turned off the computer. I could not explain her behavior in any way. She said she did it because she needed love and I wasn't there for her. I have no previous experience with wives cheating on me, but this has to be one of the most lame excuses for cheating in the history of cheating. When I confronted her, she didn't even try to deny it. This happened because her parents knew that I took the panties and guessed what was in them. They probably waited until she got up the next morning and talked to her, so by the time I arrived she knew it was all over. That week at work after I watched part of the video was a godsend. I was busy all day every day, so the memory of the video is somewhat faded. Kirby Dickinson called me on Friday and said we had an appointment with her and her lawyer on Monday. When I arrived, her parents were with her. I asked Kirby to tell them that we were going to show a graphic video and it might be better if her parents weren't there. He told Liz's lawyer about it. We saw him talking to the three of them. I saw Liz shake her head, no. I heard her say, I don't believe them. Fine. The gloves were off and, as Kirby said earlier, the game is on. It didn't take long. Her lawyer demanded that adultery be excluded as a reason for divorce. Moral cruelty should be substituted instead because I caused her so much mental suffering that she couldn't bear to be around me. That is why she was forced to practically live with her parents. Kirby and I looked at each other. My computer was on the table and the video played right from where I left it. I looked at them all. Elizabeth, I said, 
I only called her on very rare occasions to get her attention. Are you sure you want your parents to see this? See what? I'm holding hands with some guy. Or I dance with him. Take the best photo. I pressed the play button, and the whole room saw her with two men at the same time. Stop it. My God. Stop it. She screamed. Her mother lost consciousness, and her father tried to revive her, all the while looking intently at his daughter. As her mother approached, her father looked at her. I want you to leave our house. Today. He and his wife didn't seem to have any problem with her cheating until they saw the extent of her depravity. He carefully helped his wife up and left the room. He stopped as he approached me. You know, you didn't have to do that. If I didn't do this, would you believe me? I asked. No, I don't. Probably not. But there could be a better way. Was. Your daughter didn't have to lie. We never heard from them again, and when we were assigned to court, neither Liz nor her lawyer showed up. Six weeks later, I was a free man with all our meager possessions and no alimony. Another six weeks, and I was ordered to go play sand trap in the Middle East. I spent two days with Ruth and her husband, and then went home to spend time with my parents and other siblings. I drove my truck to my parents' house and left it with my dad to use and look after while I was away. Matthew was on another tour with his megastar. My two other siblings still lived in Madisonville. Both were married and had children. I lived for a year in a sand trap with nothing but bad memories. I returned as a newly appointed captain, and it was nice. My new assignment took me to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, to become a garrison commander at the Command and General Staff College. It was a chosen assignment for any captain, but being assigned there as a junior captain with no command experience was a mistake. I even called my Washington, D.C. branch to confirm this. Are you complaining, Captain Reynolds? Because if you do, there are a couple hundred other captains who would love to take your place. No, no, I'm completely happy. I just wanted to make sure that someone didn't admit a mistake and reassign me after three months. No, Captain Reynolds, you're locked up for three years unless we need you in the sand trap again. If that happens, you can send one of those 200 other captains you mentioned to my place. We both laughed at this. It didn't take me long to get into a good, steady rhythm. Of course, it didn't hurt that I had an experienced first sergeant in charge of my affairs. One Saturday, I was at the auto repair shop at the post office. We were provided with space and equipment for minor repairs to our personal vehicles. There was even an experienced mechanic who could help those who needed it. I wasn't an expert, but I grew up in the country and knew the difference between a spark plug and a nut, so I was pretty good at what I did. It wasn't crowded when I arrived, so I started changing the oil. There were three pits under the car for oil changes and work. I had been in the hole for about five minutes when another car drove through the hole next to me. I never paid any attention to it until I heard, damn piece of crap. This came from a soft but decisive female voice. It was quiet again until the wrench fell and hit the concrete floor. Oh my gosh, I heard. I chuckled to myself and decided that maybe the voice needed help. I tightened the drain plug and climbed the steps out of the hole. I went down the steps and found myself in a hole next to mine. She was wearing a jumpsuit two sizes too big. Can I help you? I asked. She turned and looked at me, and I saw what was probably an attractive face under a layer of oil. She spat out a mouthful of oil and looked at me. Why do you think I need help? Because I'm a woman, and women don't know how to change their own oil. Oh no, it just seemed like you might be upset, and I thought I could help. No thanks, I know what I do. I just hate this damn car. Fine, have a good day. I returned to my car, filled up the oil, and drove away without seeing her again. The following week, I attended a cocktail party hosted by the commanding general. I was invited only because I was the garrison commander and not because I was in the atmosphere of three generals and countless colonels assigned to Fort Leavenworth. I grabbed a Coca-Cola and wandered around, trying to see if there were any other officers of my age and rank with whom I might have something in common. I really didn't expect to find any, 
and I wasn't disappointed. I looked at my watch and decided that I still had 15 minutes, protocol-wise, before I could leave with dignity. The courtyard looked like a promising place to spend some time, so I headed there. I was just walking out the door when I heard a voice. Anyway, my father insisted that I learn how to do everything myself if I ever find myself in a difficult situation, so I decided to change the oil myself. It took me over an hour, and I was covered in oil, from my hair to my nails, including my mouth. I even spilled it on the instructions, making them almost unreadable. But the worst part was that this incredibly nice guy offered to help, and I told him I didn't need help. If I was smarter, I would have asked for help just to get his name and phone number. The group around her laughed until another female voice spoke. What do you mean, would you ask for his name and number? You've never done this before. I know, but there was something in his face that, I don't know. I cannot explain it. There was just something about him. And I noticed this even when I was angry and upset. Wow. He must have been something special. I think yes. I chuckled and tried to see who was talking. I wanted to see what it looked like without the oil. I walked through the doors onto the terrace and looked left, then right. On the right were three women. One of them was about my age, maybe a couple of years younger, but who knows. Our eyes met for the briefest of moments before I turned and went back inside. I knew that she recognized me. I found a corner where I could stand back and watch. The three women walked inside and immediately headed to the front door. Most military homes have a stand with a bowl, saucer, or metal tray just outside the front door where military guests leave their calling cards with their name and rank, and you left one every time you were a guest in this house. The women walked over to the card stand and began looking through them. They found one and gathered around to look at it, then looked at me. I tried to make myself as inconspicuous as possible, but being the only junior officer in a house full of senior officers was quite funny. It was not difficult for them to guess which card was mine. I was in uniform and the only officer below the rank of major. All they had to do was look through the cards until they found mine. Plus, my badge said Reynolds. I was wondering whether I should go up and ask her about the car, thereby giving myself away, or wait and see what they, or rather she, were going to do. I hadn't dated for a long time and was almost desperate for sex, but I decided to wait. When my internal protocol timer went off, I went to the hostess, the wife of Major General Morris T. Woodley thanked her for a wonderful time and found my hat, which was the only one on the table without a gold rim. Twice I glanced furtively at the three women who were equally furtively watching me. The mystery lady and I had two common places. The first is a party at the General's, the second is a car repair shop. I couldn't hang out at the General's house hoping she would show up, but I could spend time in the workshop. Saturday morning I washed and waxed my truck in the shop. I took my time and was almost finished when I saw her car pull up. She came out and wasn't wearing overalls. She was wearing jeans and a white t-shirt with shiny gold stuff on the front. My truck was inside the building and she was parked outside. She got out of the car and walked towards me when she was stopped by a man whom I recognized as a major from the barracks. He started talking to her, and it seemed like she wanted to leave him, but he continued the conversation. We made eye contact for one second before I looked away. I finished and people were waiting for my seat, so I couldn't wait any longer, I had to leave. Her eyes never left me as I got into the truck and drove away. I stopped on the side of the road and waited. Less than five minutes later, I saw her quickly pull up, so I pulled out and headed to the PX. There were a lot of people and I had to park quite far from the door. Several parking spots near the door were reserved. The seat closest to the door was reserved for the commanding general. Her car was parked at this place. I almost turned around and went home. Glad I didn't do this. She was standing right at the door when I entered. Are you playing hard to reach? That was the first thing she said, but she said it with a smile. No, madam. Why, are you trying to get me? She laughed out loud. Interest ask. I'm not sure. Can I get you? Probably. But I'm not cheap. She pointed to the diner counter in the hallway. Is Coca-Cola okay? Now it was my turn to laugh. 
as long as you don't expect too much. At the diner, we grabbed a Coca-Cola. She had a diet and paid for both. We sat at a table and three hours passed before we realized it. Her phone rang at least six times and she ignored it. Finally, she looked at her watch and jumped up. Crap, I have a date, I have to go. I woke up. Now who plays hard to get? We went to her car and she left for her date. I haven't had a good dinner for a long time, so I decided to go to the officer's club. Their prime rib was excellent. I went to the barracks, hung out there for a bit, took a shower, put on a civilian suit and headed to the club. The dining room was closed due to a party, but the grill was open, so I sat there and ate. After eating, I headed towards the exit and looked into the cafeteria along the way. Right in the doorway, dancing closely, was the major from the barracks, and, uh, it became clear to me that I didn't know her name. After all our conversations, I never asked her name, and she didn't offer it. I stood watching them dance until another couple pushed them, and she looked my way. I turned and headed towards the exit. The barracks was within walking distance of the club, so I headed there. The lobby had two large TVs, a bar and a refreshment table that was constantly stocked by the officer's club. I sat down, grabbed a Coca-Cola, and watched some reruns of NASCAR racing. I spent about two hours there and was about to go to my room when the major entered. He grabbed himself a beer and sat down in the big chair next to mine. He asked me about the race, and I answered that he did not pay attention to her. You are the garrison commander, aren't you? He asked. Yes, it is. He extended his hand. Ernie Bigelow, post operations officer. Mark Reynolds, you already know where I work. We sat and talked. He was a nice, friendly person who was easy to talk to, so after some time I told him that I had seen him dancing at the club. Your companion looked familiar. He laughed. She must. This is General Woodley's daughter, Christina. I don't want to get into personal matters, but do you have something with her? I asked. He laughed loudly. Hell no. Nobody has anything to do with Miss Iceberg. I've met her a few times, and every time I think I'm going to get at least first base, she knocks me off my feet. Then why do you keep trying? I asked. Again, I don't know. Either I hope to melt her, or I'm a masochist. He looked at me. It's funny that you ask who she is, because she saw you this evening and asked me if I knew who you were. He laughed. Not wanting competition, I said I don't know. Ernie Bigelow and I became friends. Three days later, Christina Woodley called me and invited me to dinner. I agreed. That evening, I was sitting in the barracks lobby and Ernie sat next to me. He looked at me. I hear you have a date with Christina. Yes, on Friday for dinner. How do you know? Because I called and invited her to dinner. She said without hesitation that she already had a date and with whom. It surprised me, I said. She's pretty private with her phone number. Do you mind if I ask how you got it? I don't have one. She didn't give it to me. Then how did you ask her on a date? You can't just walk up and knock on her door. I hesitated. I didn't invite her. She called and invited me. I didn't think about how she got my number. She had my name on a business card that I left at her house, and she had access to the post's telephone directory. Easily. He looked at me and laughed. Well, damn it. I've known her for almost two years, and she's never asked a man out. You must be very special. I don't know about that. Listen, she rarely goes on dates. Since I've been here, she's only gone on dates with me and two other guys. We're a pretty close group and keep an eye on each other, hoping to hear if one of us has moved on. For now, a few slow dances and a couple of kisses on the cheek is the most we can hope for. We sat and talked, and as I said, we became friends. He sincerely wished me good luck with Christina. Just keep me posted, and I'll let the other two know about you and your progress. Our dinner date went great, so good that I asked her out on another date, and so on. Ernie found out he was being transferred to Korea and invited her to his farewell dinner, but she turned him down. Her exact words, as he said, were, I like Mark Ernie. I really like him, and I don't want to spoil it.
I always picked her up from her house for our dates and interacted with both of her parents. They obviously didn't hate me, but they didn't welcome me with open arms either. I dated Christina for six months, and if you count second base as touching her breasts, I reached second base. She said no one had ever gone this far. In the seventh month of our relationship, I received orders to go back to the Middle Eastern sandbox. I called my appointment department and asked about this. I thought I had a three-year stabilization tour, I told my appointments manager. You were Mark, but you must have really pissed someone off because we were ordered to reassign you immediately. You should arrive in the country in two weeks. Two weeks? Usually they give at least 30 days. I called Christina. She was even more upset than I was. We talked for a few minutes, and when we finished talking, she said, I love you, Mark. She had never said this before. By 9 p.m. the next day, I was packed and ready to leave the next morning. Christina had to come to say goodbye. Someone knocked on the door. I opened it, and it was her. She threw herself on my neck, and we kissed. My father did it, she said. Did what? Send you. Why? He knows how I feel about you, and he's afraid he'll lose me. He will still lose you, to me or to someone else. What do you mean to someone else? No others. They will, if I don't come back. She hugged me again. Do not say that. She looked at me. Marry me, she said. What? Marry me. This will fix everything. I laughed. Marrying me just to piss off your father is not a reason for marriage. She pulled away and sat down in a chair. Then I'll stay here for the night. This will really piss him off. I laughed again. I would like you to stay, but you just had a fight with your father. Where do you think he'll send the military police if you don't come home? Then let's go to a motel outside the post office. I knelt in front of her. I love you. Our first night together will not be a night of revenge or secrecy. It will be with our heads held high, proudly, and we will announce our love to the whole world. She took my face in her hands, kissed me and laughed. I've already done it. Everyone in Leavenworth knows I love you, especially my father. That's why he sent you. We sat hugging each other in a chair. I hadn't had sex in a long time, and having a woman, a 26-year-old virgin, ready, willing, and able to get into bed with me was very tempting. My problem was that I loved her and wanted our first time to be perfect, which it wasn't. We were kissing when her phone rang. Hi, Mom, she said and turned on the speakerphone. Where are you? asked her mother. In the barracks with Mark. When are you going to come back home? When Mark leaves tomorrow. She looked at me and smiled. There was a sharp breath. You know your father will kill you both, don't you? He already did it, Mom, when he sent Mark. What should I tell him? Tell him that I'm an adult and will do what I want. Goodbye, Mom. You know the military police are probably on their way, I said. I don't care. That's because you'll just go home and I'll go to prison. She threw herself on my neck. We kissed and hugged for a long time. Then she looked into my eyes. I love you. You know it. I've never been in love before, and I know that you love me. Do you want to know how I know this? Yes, I said. Except for the two times you touched my breasts, you never tried to go any further. This tells me that you respect me and are taking your time. We both know this will happen. You will be the first man to make love to me. She reached out and began to unbutton her blouse. When everything is scarith buttons were unbuttoned, so she took them off. She then unclasped her bra from the back. Without hesitation, she took it off. She reached her hands to my head and pulled me towards her. I touched them, but never kissed them. No one has ever done this, she sighed, breathless. I want you to remember them and come back for them. We need to stop, otherwise we won't stop, I said. I know, but I never thought it would be so pleasant, she answered, breathing heavily. She put her blouse back on, leaving her bra on. Just remember that they belong to me. No one else will see or touch them. She kissed me and smiled. They are yours forever. She stood up, took her bra and walked over to my travel bag. I didn't close it, so she folded her bra and put it inside. She looked at me and then walked away crying. 
Early the next morning, I waited for Major General Woodley when he arrived at his headquarters. When his driver arrived, I opened the door for him. He looked surprised when he saw me. He, of course, knew me. Why are you here, Captain? He asked. I'm here to tell you what a cowardly father you are. You may be a good general, but you are a terrible parent. You can send me anywhere, even to the federal penitentiary on the other side of this base, but I will say what I think. I love your daughter, and she says she loves me. This is probably new to you because as far as I understand, she has never been in love before, and this scares you because one day you will lose her to another man. It could be me, Ernie Bigelow, some private in training, or some civilian doctor, but one day you will lose her, and when that happens, I hope it hurts you as much as your decision to send me causes pain to her. When you see her at dinner tonight, look at her knowing that you broke her heart because you did. She'll probably forget about me in a year, which is what I'm sure you want. But she will fall in love again, and perhaps again. And every time this happens, you will lose more and more until she hates you. I didn't even salute him when I left. I fully expected to be stopped leaving the base and taken to jail, but that didn't happen. I went to see my sister Ruth and then visited my parents. I left my truck with my parents for my dad to use and look after while I was gone. I put my things in storage. I spent the day with Ruth. During my stay, she told me the latest news about my ex-wife. It turned out that after leaving prison, she began filming for an adult film. Everything was going well until it turned out that she was sending her works of art by mail. The federal government looks at this very strictly. As a result, she received three to five years in prison. After Ruth, I spent three days with my parents. I called Christina frequently before leaving and learned that the day I left Leavenworth, she had moved out of her parents' house into a furnished apartment in town, which had greatly angered her father. She refused to talk to him, and according to her mother, he didn't know whether to be angry or hurt, so he was both. I arrived at the departure point and checked in. The sergeant behind the desk looked at my orders, apologized, and went into the office to get them. A few minutes later, he returned with the first lieutenant. Excuse me, Captain Reynolds, but could you come to my office? I followed him. Have a seat, Captain. He paused to collect his thoughts. Your orders have changed. It appears your original orders were issued in error. Fort Leavenworth is under investigation to find out what happened, but here are your new orders. You must return to Leavenworth and resume your previous duties. He raised his hands. I've never seen anything like this. I have seen orders change, but never a soldier returns to his original assignment. And on top of everything else, we received this yesterday by personal courier to deliver it to you. It was a sealed envelope with the return address to the commanding general of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The lieutenant gave me new orders. Congratulations, Captain. You are returning home. I went outside and opened the envelope. It said, You were right. Signed, M. Woodley. I picked up the phone and called Christina. She answered the first call. Where are you? Driving home. Did you know that my orders have been cancelled? Are you kidding? What's happened? It seems your father has changed his mind. I'm heading back to Leavenworth. Oh my God, how soon can you come? A couple of days. I need to pick up the truck and then I'll go from there. Hurry up, honey. I'll start looking for a bigger apartment. I broke all records for return time. We talked on the phone constantly for the last 50 miles and she ran out to meet me when I turned onto the street where she lived. The truck barely had time to stop before I got out and ran into her arms. We kissed and hugged as cars passed us. Military towns are accustomed to such homecoming scenes. It took a few minutes to calm down and go inside, where we continued kissing and hugging. After the first passion subsided, we sat on the sofa and started talking. She spoke to her mother, but not to her father. Her mother didn't know my orders had been changed, but she was happy for her daughter when she found out. I showed her a short note from her father. What does it mean? She asked. I told her about my meeting with him in the morning before leaving. I'm surprised he didn't put you in jail for talking to him like that, she said. Me too. I'm sure it went against everything he holds sacred to change your orders, she said. 
He didn't do it for me. He did this for you because he loves you, and it's hard for him to come to terms with the fact that he's no longer the only man in your life. She looked at me with love in her eyes. I looked at her, stood up and took out the ring I bought in Tennessee when I picked up the truck. I got down on one knee. Before I said a word, she was already crying. Christina Louise Woodley, will you marry me? She quickly knelt down on both knees, extended her left hand and spoke. Put it on my finger. Once the ring was where it would be for the next fifty years, she spoke again. Yes, Mark Hadley Reynolds, I will marry you and love you until the end of my days. The kiss we exchanged changed my life. I felt it in my body and in my soul, and I knew that I would love this woman all my life. Every man believes that his wife or girlfriend is the most beautiful and perfect in the world, and I was no exception. I asked her if she wanted to spend our first night together in a first-class hotel, but she said no. This apartment is our first home. I want our first night to be in our first home. She had time to prepare to prepare for my return, and she did it her way. We had champagne, pate, and chocolate-covered strawberries for our first dinner together in this apartment. I even drank some champagne. She wanted to take a bubble bath before starting. She did so and walked out wearing a blue set consisting of panties, a bra and some sort of cape that highlighted the entire outfit. While she opened the champagne and served the pate, I took a quick shower. I only put on my robe when I went into the bedroom. We sat on the bed, ate and drank. From time to time we kissed. The food gradually disappeared and the kisses became more frequent until the tray of food disappeared. We stood next to the bed and she untied the belt of my robe. She held the robe together and looked into my eyes. This is the first time I've undressed a man, Mark. I always wanted it to be with the true love of my life, and that is you. I know men call me an ice queen, but I promise you that I will try to be the best bitch for you whenever you want it. With that, she threw the robe off my shoulders and let it fall to the floor. She looked at my naked body with obvious admiration before slowly running her hands all over my body. After good sex, she took my hand and we headed into the shower. Her phone woke us up at ten. Hello, Mom, she said joyfully. As usual, she put the phone on speakerphone. Good morning. Any news from Mark? Should he be back today? She looked at me and smiled widely. He came back yesterday and spent the night with me, Mom. Oh. Well then, he asked me to marry him, Mom, and I said yes. We heard her mother perk up. It is wonderful. When is the wedding? Christina laughed. We don't know yet. We thought we'd discuss this with you and Dad over dinner tonight. Will this be okay? This was news to me, so I just looked at her with big eyes, thinking she was crazy. She looked at me and winked. It will be wonderful. What wine does Mark prefer? He doesn't usually drink but he'll drink some champagne with us. Fine. See you at 6.30. Is it suitable? Perfect. See you. Oh, should I tell your father, or would you rather do it yourself? Tell him if you think he can handle it, otherwise let Mark tell him. When the call ended, she looked at me and said, Take me, groom. This was a request that I never refused to fulfill. We rang the doorbell at 6.30. Christina's father opened the door. Why are you ringing the bell? You have the key, he told his daughter. I know, but I don't live here anymore, Dad. I saw him wince, but he was much happier when his daughter hugged him and kissed him on the cheek. I heard a quiet thank you from her as she kissed him. It wasn't easy for him. He extended his hand to shake me, and I responded. Dinner is on the table, so let's go, he said. We were in a small family dining room, not one reserved for large dinners. Christina and I sat opposite each other. The champagne had already been poured. Dad, Mom, Mark wants to say something. I took a deep breath. First, General Woodley, I want to thank you for any assistance you provided in countermanding my orders. I formulated it this way, knowing that it was he and he alone who was responsible for both the issuance and subsequent cancellation of orders. Secondly, General Woodley, Mrs. Woodley, I want you to know that I love your daughter and asked her to marry me. And I agreed, Christina said, holding out her hand first to her mother, 
then to her father. Her mother was delighted and happy. Her father, I'm sure, was told to take it with dignity and not to make himself an ass. He was so generous that he proposed a toast. After dinner, the two women went somewhere to start planning the wedding. The general and I went to the library, where he poured two ports. I understand that you don't drink alcohol except on special occasions. I think this will be the second such case this evening. I took a small glass. Congratulations, Mark. You did something I never wanted to see. He took a small sip and invited us both to sit down. I knew this would happen sooner or later, but... He changed the subject. You were absolutely right in your criticism of me. I thought I knew what was best for my daughter, but when I saw the way she looked at you at dinner, I realized how wrong I was. I only ask that you take care of her and love her throughout her life as much as you love her today. You can count on it, sir. I will never hurt her. I believe he looked at me. But there is one thing I can't come to terms with. What is this, sir? I don't like that you live together before marriage. Obviously, his wife already told him. You have no choice in the matter, sir. I thought so, but I decided to try. Christina's father resigned six months after that dinner and became the CEO of a large auto parts purchasing department at a car company. Two months after that, Christina and I got married. She was clearly pregnant as she walked down the aisle. My brother Matthew showed up with his Nashville megastar who gave an impromptu concert at our reception. He gave Christina's parents copies of all his discs. Matthew told him that my parents only listened to gospel music so he gave them some of his gospel records. The day after we returned from our honeymoon, I received a call from Ernie Bigelow. He congratulated me and told me that he had won a thousand dollars from two other men who were dating Christina. They bet him that I would fail, just like them. Ernie did not agree with them and put the money in his pocket. Jason Richard Reynolds was born two months after the wedding. Six months after that, I resigned and went to work for my father-in-law. Almost from the moment he could walk, Jason became attached to his grandfather, and they became best friends. My father-in-law was always jealous when we took Jason to my parents. One weekend, Jason spent time with Woodley's grandparents at their lake house. Christina and I stayed home and lay on the couch together, watching some romantic movie. She turned to me. Mark, yes, do you like being a father? Certainly. Why do you ask? Would you like another child? I leaned back and looked at her. Are you saying that you are pregnant? She put her hand on my lap and started stroking it. No, but I want to be. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.